welcome everyone to this session of the annual conference of the African Society of International Law. Um, this is the session on regional integration and governance um, in Africa. We have um, five very seasoned, we have four very seasoned um, panelists today. Um, hi, Etienne, welcome. Um, and they'll be speaking on um, different aspects of trade integration, um, particularly with regard to the African Continental Free Trade Agreement um, and um, its effect on sub-regional arrangements in West Africa, East Africa, and the broad um, implications for Africa. Um, we're just going to wait for our final panelist to join and we'll start as soon as he does. Um, But while while we wait for Dr. Sam, I'll just um, introduce the panelists who are here already. Um, we have with us today um, Dr. Um, professor Wahab Egbewole, who is a professor, um, a senior advocate of Nigeria and a professor at the University of Ilori in Nigeria. We also have with us um, Linda, Sorry, one second. I'm trying to see if I can get Dr. Sam in the room. I'm sorry, we also have with us um, Linda Kiguhi, who's the founder and managing partner of Linda Kiguhi Advocates in um, Nairobi, Kenya. Um, we have Dr. Etienne Mark, who is a professor um, at the University of, um, I'm sorry, Etienne, I, I can't read the name of your university. I think I have it in French or something. Sorry, Etienne, could you please say the name of the university? Hello, Edith. Yeah, you hear me? Oh, I was just going to ask for the name of your university. Ah, thanks. Um, so the Paris Nanterre University um, in France and um, we're waiting for um, Dr. Falu Sam, who is a special advisor to the president of Senegal. Um, I think we will go ahead on, we'll go ahead with the presentations just so that we don't um, waste any more time than we have trying to get into the room. Um, so I'll start, I'll give the floor um, to um, Professor, well, I'll give the floor to um, Linda Kiguhi. Um, Linda is going to speak to us about um, trade facilitation under the WTO um, trade facilitation agreement and the implications for the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. And she'll speak about um, the impact of trade facilitation uh, measures in the East African community. Um, Linda. Thank you very much, Edefe, and good afternoon to everyone on the call. So um, we all know that there exists a vast amount of red tape in moving goods across the borders, and more so for us in Africa, where we deal with a lot of red tape, protectionist measures, and a lot of structural, structural challenges that make uh, movement of goods and people and services across our borders a huge challenge. A study by UNCTA that was conducted in 2019 reported that uh, the average inter-African trade at 2%, which at that time was the lowest globally. And it also reported that Sub-Saharan Africa had the highest cost in exporting compared to all other regions globally. So as you can see from the data that we have, um, exporting and importing products within the continent and even outside or into the continent is a huge challenge. Therefore, um, these are some of the things that affects the cost of trading. 
tariffs, that is the taxes that you pay, non-tariff measures such as the standards and the technical regulations, border procedures, and transport and infrastructural costs. Currently, uh, most of the trade in the continent is by landlocked countries because they have no choice but to import and export goods through their neighboring countries. And we have a number of those in Africa. The continent is also very disconnected. And currently, if I wanted to import something from Nigeria, my only option was to use DHL or use another method by air, which is very expensive. We are disconnected because the way to join the East and the Western African region is through the Central Africa, where currently we do not have any road route or rail route, which would have been easier and cheaper options for us to trade within those two regions. The WT, the World Trade Organization has uh, in 20, 2017 passed the Trade Facilitation Agreement, whose goal seeks to simplify, standardize, and harmonize customs requirements and processes whose impact is to improve by reducing the cost and the time that we take in importing and exporting goods. The biggest winners of the full implementation of the WTO trade facilitation agreement are African states and least developed countries. Now, the WTO uh, trade facilitation agreement on a highlight recommends the following kind of measures that can help reducing the costs and the time that we take to import and export goods, rapid release and clearance of goods by custom agents, availability of information on rules and procedures, um, automations and e-services, this is for the sake of payments, allowing people to pay online, and also allowing people to make application of the various certificates online instead of physically visiting the, the governmental institutions and filling out the forms to get the clearance certificates. It also provides for disciplines for fees and penalties that this information becomes clear to organizations that are importing or exporting so that they are able to be informed on time before they engage in the exporting or importing to know the costs of the entire process. The TFA also recommends harmonized processes and standards. Right now, African countries are trading within the regional economic communities, and each of those regional economic communities have respective goals, including like common markets protocol, for this African community, there's a customs union, trade facilitation agreement. So trade within our regional economic communities becomes easier when the members agree to standardize and harmonize their policies, which will lead to having uh, in having rules and procedures and payments and costings that are in sync and not different and then cost have come with a burden to people importing and exporting in these regions. The TFA also recommends opportunities for consultations and appeals in the event that um, when you approach an institution, they give you um, a, a requirement or refuse to give you a certificate and you feel that you have been unjustly treated. Then lastly, it, um, it provides a trade facilitation agreement facility, which is an online facility with all the information needed and, and policies and practices to assist the least developed countries in implementing the trade facilitation agreement. One issue or one positive thing about the WTO trade facilitation agreement is that it does not have a timeline for their members to implement the, the agreement. Members are to determine their own implementation schedules of implementing the trade facilitation agreement, which is not the same as other agreements, which usually have a specific time when you need to implement the full measures. I will now go over a highlight of the African community and the situation on ground. It's one of the most celebrated regional economic communities in Africa due to its high level of um, advancement. It has, for instance, a number of protocols, including the customs union protocol, common market protocol, and the trade facilitation agenda. The Trade Bank East Africa, which is a nonprofit organization, has been supporting the growth of the trade in the Eastern African community and has made a significant impact in supporting the region by corridor transit time transitions, port waiting time reductions, efficient borders better infrastructure and also support with ICT in facilitating trade. 
the Eastern African community also has 13 one-stop border points that are fully operational. And these come at a huge impact in, in enabling trade and free movement of goods. Usually when you're traveling between uh, two countries in Africa, you have to visit by road, you have to visit one, one counter and clear with the customs and then cross over to the other side and clear with the customs of the other country. But one-stop borders uh, ensure that the officials of the two different countries are in one place and a traveler or an importer or an exporter only visits one building and gets all the permits and the clearances you need. And you don't have to spend so much time by crossing over and whatnot, which saves a lot of time. The East African community also has an upper advantage compared to other regional economic communities due to its few number of members. Currently has only five members compared to the many members of the SADC region or the ECOWAS region. So we can say that uh, it is favored by having fewer members and it enables the Eastern African community to be able to come up with a lot of policies and protocols and get them passed quickly and seamlessly. And while the Eastern African community has made commendable progress, the region still faces a couple of challenges because um, we, you still find that you need to fill in a lot of uh, forms in order for you to get clearance certificates from the different institutions. You will engage different institutions when you're getting um, the clearances that you need as an importer and an exporter. And uh, you will need numerous number of certificates in order for you to be able to import or uh, export. And there are no, not many options for you to be able to apply online for the clearance certification, which is a, a serious um, issue. The AFTA um, is a free trade area, but a East African community is a common market. These two are very different. And which means the AFTA has its own challenges, structural, structural challenges that come up and will affect uh, trading, trade facilitation measures because members of the African uh, AFTA are free to enter into agreements with other members as they please. Whereas in a common markets, all the members of the common markets adhere to similar protocols and similar policies. So far, the, there's been a positive um, step by the AFTA by coming up with the Pan-African Payment and Settlement System which is supported by the Afriaxim Bank, and it's a method of them simplifying payments in the future. Currently, if you want to import or export, you have to go through a long process of engaging middle banks, like Exim banks. In my opinion, I feel that the stage that we are right now of phase two negotiations of the protocols on intellectual quality, protocol on investment, and, and the protocol on competition policy is the hardest because these protocols will make a huge impact on the practical implementation of the after, and they will come up with a lot of policies and principles to guide us in how we, were, we are able to trade within the African continental free trade area. So um, I hope that we will be able to borrow some of the suggestions that the WTO trade facilitation agreement is offering. And instead of Africa reinventing the wheel, um, it would make sense to see what is happening in the Eastern African community and where the ESC has failed, borrow lessons from the WTO trade facilitation agreement in order to enable us to trade, to improve our trade facilitation and improve inter-African trade. Thank you. Thank you very much, Linda. Perfect, right on time. Um, so we'll move on to the next speaker, Dr. Etienne Mark. Um, and he will be speaking on um, the private international law rules within the Ohada community estates. Um, Etienne, over to you. Thank you very much, Edefe. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm very glad and humbled to be part of such an impressive event, and I thank the association and its member to make it possible. I would like to take the advantage of this event that brings us together to share with you some observation and thoughts on a theme that I believe to be important in our context. This reflection, I hope, will arouse your interest and will lead to some exchange with the audience. The subject I have chosen to address 
is the current draft uniform act on private international law of the organization of the harmonization of business law in Africa, the OADA. And I wanted to discuss this project in the context of the AFC F FTA, sorry. Inter interactions between private international law and regional integration generate dynamics and give rise to very rich consideration, particularly in the African context. And I would like to outline some of them. I would like also to make it clear that I will not address the issue of overlapping membership in several regional economic communities and the conflicts of norms that they generate. The AFC FTA is definitely good news for intra-African business relations. There is every reason to believe that the establishment of common rules at the continental level to promote freedom of persons, goods, and capital would lead to a boost of intra-African trade relations. This, this will necessarily increase also the number of contractual situations involving foreign elements and generating flows between several legal systems. And it would be most unfortunate, however, if the tariff and non-tariff barriers that the AFC FTA is striving to lower were to be replaced by other barriers, this time legal ones, caused by indeterminacy of governing law, by indeterminacy of competent jurisdiction, and by indeterminacy related to recognition and enforcement of judicial and extrajudicial acts. For some years now, however, Africanist authors drawing on the European uh, precedent have noted that private international law is essential to regional integration and development of pan-African trade calls for a regionalization, and I would say to please Professor Mbenge, an Africanization of rules of private international law are not new in Africa, but come essentially from Commonwealth Africa. As recently as October 20, Professor Fripongo Pong of Ghana regretted on Afronomix law that the AFC FTA member states are making such an effort to establish mechanism for interstate disputes, cross border as the transition instrument primarily by private traders. Recently, embarking on the draft uniform act for private international law seems to be catching up on these issues. At first glance, it might seem inappropriate to request for mechanism of applicable law or recognition of judicial decision characterized by an uniform law and a common court of justice and arbitration. Also, there is an uniform law in the 17 member states that together form the WADA space. This space is in reality an hybrid legal space where national laws and uniform laws national jurisdiction and a single supranational habit more or less harmonious. It's here and there in a particular manner, where mechanism of international law. This mechanism are of two kinds. The first establishes the precedence of uniform law and the CCGA over domestic laws and jurisdictions. The second is intended to fill the gaps in uniform law by referring to the laws and jurisdictions of the legal system in which is located the business centers of gravity. As for the provisions on the circulation of judicial and extrajudicial acts, we may only be struck by a deficiencies of mechanisms. Apart from decision of the CCGA, which are directly binding in all member states and the community and executive of arbitral awards rendered under the umbrella of the CCGA, the issues of the circulations of judicial and extrajudicial acts seems to have largely, be, largely been in your, ignored sorry, by the view awarder. So given the actual absence of systematic private international rules in uniform law, these rules thought, uh, should be uh, thought among national provisions. However, if they exist at all, these national rules are fragmentary and very often anachronistic. The theory of conflicts of law is not dealt through OADA national codes. And in most of them, 
this issue are only dealt through family law and the statues of persons. The civil, the civil code of Gabon, sorry, is to my knowledge, the only code in the region to deal with the determination of government law in contractual matters. Unfortunately, it does so in a rather outdated manner, design, designating as governing law in the absence of choice by the parties, the place of signature of the contract. We may also refer here to a rare decision of the Court of Appeal of Ouagadougou in 2001, which decided that the law of the place of the residence of the party providing the essential obligation shall govern the contract. Therefore, <clears throat> as it stands, the determination of the governing law is based on the lex forism, on the method of determination of the national judge. And this, this situation is understandably problematic. Since the applicability of the OADA uniform law is determined by the rules of the private international law of the national judge, it is very possible that for the very same legal situation, the applicability of the uniform law would differ according to which court is seized. Do you provide any elements to build a general system of determination? As for national stage, none of them deals with the international competence of the courts, and none of them provides for mechanism for our level which has independence or connected. The issue of the circulation of judicial and extrajudicial acts outside from the EU also ruin. The applicable international and international are made all the people in their modality of control. The judicial cooperation function of the yeah, I believe I'm back. Oh, there. Yeah, you're back. Yes, so, sorry about that. So yeah. I was just saying that the applicable international and bilateral conventions uh, in the region are rather old and not very practicable in the modalities of control. Also, the national provisions. Uh, may be restrictive and sometimes confer a real discretionary power to the enforcement judge, either through re-examination revision on the merits or through a possible control of reciprocity in the condition of the executive process. There are, however, here and there, more liberal provisions favoring enforcement of foreign decisions and coping against dilatory measures and contradictory decisions. Um, I may quote, for, for instance, um, the Bilateral Convention on Judicial Cooperation between Mali and Niger of 1964, conferring the reciprocal and direct, direct enforceability of judicial decisions rendered in both jurisdictions. This will bring me to my last uh, and conclusive point, that the drafters of the proposed Uniform Act on private international law could indeed draw inspiration from more progressive provision to move forward the OADA natural spirit of integration and confidence. The initiative for such draft uniform act is timely and salutary. Such a draft would make it possible to fill the gaps, the gaps that I have just described, which continue to undermine the predictability and attractiveness of the OADA space, and which still prevent the creation of a truly integrated economic area. This momentum is, I believe, an important one. It is not simply about the adoption of a new uniform act that would come after many other. It is truly a new approach. Harmonization is certainly pursued through unification, but for the very first time, this unification relates to rules of determination, competence, and enforcement that would bring into play non-unified but national provision, jurisdictions, and decisions. It is therefore a question of placing a keystone at the earth of the composite edifice that is the other space, so that this space is no longer solely focused on the interest of foreign investors, but gives full measure to its African dimension. This is indeed what is at stake when promoting Af inter-African state trade, sorry, through clear and common private international law rules, restoring full confidence in local traders, but also in domestic judge and legislators. And gonna be my very, very last point that Africa, uh, the OADA is indeed a pan-African organization in extension. However, 
its legal DNA remains irreductibly that of a civil law. The legal harmonization that this organization could provide, even through uniform private international law rules, cannot be carried out on a continental scale without finding a common language with the countries from Commonwealth Africa. This is by no means fit, but one can dream given the past taken so far and the horizons now opened up by the entry into force of the AFC FTA. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Etienne. Um, so um, we'll move on now to Dr. Falu Sam, um, who's going to be speaking about trade governance under, under the Continental Free Trade Agreement. Um, Dr. Sam, welcome. Thank you very much, uh, dear Prof. Jomo. Uh, thank you also very much, uh, dear colleagues. Uh, and also, um, first of all, my sincere apology uh, for um, being late uh, in this session. I was actually in the room, but uh, I um, was not uh, in the right track. Uh, it's always good to be in the right track, in the good track. It's part of governance also. Uh, secondly, and lastly, on this chapter, I would like to, um, to you, convey an extent to the organizer uh, my very uh, deep uh, and sincere uh, gratitude for uh, inviting me in this uh, conference uh, and uh, only to share uh, elements uh, on this uh, governance and trade perspective. Um, I don't have prepared note or statement. Uh, I'll be speaking uh, from the floor, as they would say, uh, to share maybe uh, four, three or four points. The first is the centrality of governance in uh, not only national, but in international uh, arena and fora, because this is the um, location and this is the mechanism whereby uh, if we need to abide by the law, by rules, if we need to uh, um, abide by efficiency and efficacy, we need to have um, a very uh, straightforward set of rules and roles uh, and laws and procedures uh, in order really to uh, make sure that uh, uh, we arrive at, at the impact, at the um, uh, realization of the objectives that we all set. Uh, be individually, be it um, institut institutionally. Uh, so no wonder then that the governance is at the core of trade, especially in particular with uh, FCFTA. Why? Because trade is more and more part of our economies. Remember trade was in terms of still uh, about governance was one of the major element or I would say the very last thing uh, element of the whole international machinery after the Second World War to not only end wars, but to uh, arrive at peace, but to sustain peace. Uh, this is the inception and the implementation of the General Agreement on Trade and Tariff, the GATT, which, which lasted until uh, 1994 with the inception and the signature of the agreement um, of the creation of WTO, the World Trade Organization. Uh, during all of these years, we didn't uh, experience uh, any major trouble or any wars. This is one of the main objectives. They say that not only we need United Nations, not only we need um, Security Council, uh, but we, only, we also need mechanism whereby uh, countries, companies, and people will find more commonality and more way of cooperation than really uh, breaking. Uh, the borders and um, uh, um, uh, doing business uh, in a way that will be conducive not only to economy and to peace. That's why we have this very long lasting peace of prosperity, um, noticeably after the uh, uh, economic and financial crisis of uh, uh, 1921 and some other sporadic uh, crisis uh, in uh, 1979 or in the early 90s. So since then we have this and trade have been playing a better and a bigger role in uh, not only uh, enticing peace, but sustaining peace in a way that is really conclusive. The third element is that uh, from that, 
um, the African have learned lessons because the Africa um, since the, well, the two world war have been the most trouble in terms of war by, uh, uh, in, in terms of conflict by these wars. And that have really hampered and really impeded uh, the uh, um, uh, pace and uh, the um, speed of their efforts in development and that make them really being the larger part and the larger hosting of the least developed country, the LDCs, which is the uh, um, which, which are the uh, poorest countries in the world, among let's say the 40 to 50, uh, third uh, three quarters of them, uh, more than 30 uh, of these countries, are LDCs are in Africa. That really give a kind of overall picture, a, ki a kind of uh, dire picture, uh, really that uh, really need to be um, turned over or to be retaken, and that's exactly what arrived at. AFCFTA, the African Common Free Trade Agreement, and have been privileged enough. I've been uh, honored. I've been pleased and uh, uh, really um, lucky to be part of this process since uh, uh, 2013 uh, until now, where we are doing the implementation, uh, agreement-wise and sector-wise, uh, especially on investment competition and. Uh, like in the uh, track one panel that I was uh, uh, following for uh, um, uh, long before joining the uh, track, uh, intellectual property, uh, which is uh, uh, delivered uh, in track one of this um, ICL conference. So by doing that, FCS Secretary have uh, achieved at least three results in terms of governance. The first one is that it's possible, like to Obama, President Obama was saying, yes, we can. We can have um, a conflict-free um, um, zone, but a conflict-free zone or a conflict-free area has to go by a free trade area, number one. Number two, to signal to the world, to put the world on notice, saying that the era, like the era of the Cold War is uh, over, internationally, but the era also of conflict, the era of um, underdevelopment, the era of waste and all of these uh, mismanagement or misgovernance is also over because we are setting forth uh, uh, new rules, new mechanisms, new procedures, new process whereby really we would like to not only continue in the terms of the GATT, but also continue our different track, our personalized track in order really to have the African touch in uh, what we are doing in terms of the governance and especially the governance of trade. So what we have under AFCFTA uh, is like the WTO, the African WTO. Uh, and uh, we all agree that WTO have a very set of rules in terms of governance that is working, even though we may have uh, those uh, glitches uh, on the uh, business settlement process, uh, appellate body and all the elements that we know about uh, those. Even though we may have some difficulty in implementing special and different treatment, but more or less and more than less, we have under WTO a complete and an efficient set of rules that really has governed the world since then in a, in a very speedy way. And uh, uh, also, that's the, uh, the the third element on this um, topic on on this uh, phase um, is the election of an African a woman for the first time to be in. Uh, uh, that the general of WTO that also give additional um, comfort, additional hope, and additional space uh, for us to really uh, do what needs to be done uh, in utilizing trade. Now, what is the very mechanics of governance on trade under the AFCFTA? The very mechanics of trade under the CFTA is not only to have the machinery uh, now which is established uh, in Ghana, Accra uh, is kind of in full speed or full, full gear now, but also to um, start the operationalization of uh, the activities since January 1st uh, 20, of this year, 2021. And um, uh, many things have been done, many things need to be done. But if you look at to the way um, in one hand that uh, uh, EU have uh, achieved or have uh, sustained its integration like more than 60 years, uh, we may have this shortcut, we may have this kind of leapfrogging exercise 
whereby we will we'll, we'll, we'll don't will not need and the way we have structured this negotiation and this implementation uh, really give us uh, impetus and give us hope and reality actually that uh, we will not um, uh, extend 60 years but maybe 16 or 6 or 10 or at least half of this or maybe even uh, uh, lesser than that anyway we'll be doing it in a very short period that also will signal to the founding fathers of the African Union of, or the African organization, uh, African unity, or the founding father or the visionaries uh, that uh, have implemented or have drafted the Abuja Treaty on uh, African Economic Union that we are now following through. We are now following suit and we are um, making ourselves available a set of uh, toolbox that really uh, could really uh, assist us in achieving this. And finally, uh, Mrs. Chairman, uh, dear Prof and dear colleague, uh, let me just uh, uh, cite uh, two elements of this governance that really uh, would be instrumental, uh, will be key in delivering the very result or the very objective, the very promises of IFC, the IFC FTA. Number one is investment. We cannot develop, we cannot have any country develop without investment because not only investment brings capital, money, uh, but also investment brings um, by virtue of investment, by virtue of company, uh, technology, transfer of technology and know-how. Investment also bring uh, empowerment and manpower, uh, empowerment, including for you, for women, and including for small um, SME, the, for the SMEs, uh, in order really to uh, arrive at uh, generating a substantive uh, uh, value addition in the countries in terms of uh, really uh, making our economy grow. So the protocol, the draft protocol that is now under negotiation under the EFCFTA is just a pro development, is just uh, in terms of substance, but uh, in terms of uh, software, but in terms of governance, in terms of uh, hardware, is changing the landscape of the investment promotion agency in a way that they will no longer do business as usual. This is a use. Maybe some that are not very inter, very involved in FCFTA, or maybe some that are involved in FCFTA, but they are not very involved in terms of investment uh, per se in their country or in the region or under the context of uh, FCFTA, maybe uh, underestimating this, but this is uh, an earthquake. Uh, this is really a uh, changing of guards that is be doing, uh, whereby those agency will have to do things that they were not, uh, um, doing uh, before, like um, uh, uh, really monitoring, screening, uh, not only investors, but the investment um, um, screening uh, for like uh, money laundering, screening for uh, uh, efficiency, screening for uh, uh, um, uh, like um, traceability of for terrorism money and all of those elements that are really uh, plaguing our continent. Uh, in order really to um, once again, or once for all, or in a very sustained way, having investment, but having greenfield investment, but having investment that works for Africa. That's number one <coughs> example, <coughs> excuse me. Number two, and I will finish by there, uh, Madam Chair, um, is, <coughs> I'm sorry, on the issue of negotiation. We have a set of rules whereby we not have only have members, but we have regional economic communities, the RECs. Uh, initially, and it was part of the Abuja vision, RECs should have been to conduct this, but for um, whatever the process that um, have been used during the negotiation, uh, it has been turned into a member driven, which is not saying that uh, uh, RECs don't have uh, their say, to the contrary, but the very way that the chemistry is working vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, countries and vis-a-vis -vis also push uh, countries to, uh, um, to, to do the toiletage, to do the implementation of all the elements that they were subject to under the rest that didn't fulfill, that, that didn't fulfill until the inception and the implementation of FCFTA. And also uh, the member states uh, through the RECs and through the FCFTA will be subject to a new uh, set of rules that really will uh, force them to um, change guard 
to redo their trade and investment governance in a way that will be very conducive to the very promises of our country. So sorry, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Madam Chair, and uh, I will, uh, I will, uh, I will stay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sam. Thank you. I'm sure we'll come back to you um, with questions and comments. We'll just move on now to Professor Wahab Igbewole, um, who will be speaking on the challenges of regional integration under the Continental Free Trade Agreement. And he'll be looking specifically at the experience of ECOWAS. Um, welcome, Prof. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, all. Let me also join others in uh, yeah. appreciating the African Society of International Law for providing this opportunity for us to share our thoughts on this vexed subject. Uh, we all recall that uh, the AFCTA came on board about one and a half years effectively uh, ratified and uh, started in January, 2021. So it's still generally uh, a baby in the making, as it were. Mm -hmm. We must appreciate the fact that the focus is economic integration in Africa. Specifically, the agreement intends to eliminate or at least reduce tariff and non-tariff barriers within the 54 member states and focusing on what it targeted as a single market for goods and services. This paper or this study is actually intended at interrogating the workability of the agreement the possibility of uh, using the existing structure as basis to assess how successful the AFCTA is likely to be. The questions we have asked ourselves is the existing regional integrational arrangement that we have in Africa today, how effective are they? specifically using ECOWAS, the Economic Committee of West African States, as our springboard. And uh, for effect, we all recall that it was in May 1975 that ECOWAS was put in place by the Lagos Treaty. The question we ask ourselves is in five decades, what has ECOWAS achieved? Of course, a lot of achievement can be recorded, have been recorded by ECOWAS in terms of economic integration, but they are not without their challenges. And for me, if we look at the challenges that uh, ECOWAS is facing, then we will be able to appreciate what exactly is likely to be the fate of AFCTA. I predicated this discussion on three major assumptions. One, that there exist trade relations within member states intersect. That is, the 54 states have been trading within themselves, have been having integration within themselves. And if uh, we go back to what Linda said, it's obvious that there are challenges because if you have to move from West Africa to East Africa, but go through, uh, a roundabout, then we know that there is actually a challenge. The second assumption is that AFCTA is actually coming to formalize economic integration in Africa because there have been uh, in existence some form of uh, economic integration. The third uh, assumption is that there's a collective goal of the 54 member states, and that goal is economic integration. Ironically, these assumptions fall flat in the face of the reality that we are faced with in Africa. And uh, that my first assumption is actually predicated on Article 19.2 of AFCTA, 
that, oh, if there has been a better economic integration at the sub-regional levels, then this is just to hop the game. But the question is, are there trade relations, are there economic integration uh, as uh, it is expected? Yes, we cannot deny the fact that there are relations, there are economic uh, movements in the, uh, in the continent, but that is, in my view, not what uh, is the ultimate goal of uh, AFCTA. Then, if in 46 years of the existence of ECOWAS, we have not been able to move beyond, for instance, for more than 25 years, we have been talking about uh, common currency. For about one and a half years or two years, Nigeria closed its border to all its neighbors in, uh, in the economic uh, community of West African states. And that is the way it, was, it is in most uh, sub-regional economic integration. Now, what are the challenges uh, that ECOWAS is facing that we will now use as the springboard to assess the uh, movement of AFCT. One, individualism as against collectivism. What I have come to realize and in, the, in our studies is that every African state sees itself as an island unto itself. And to that extent, they prefer to interact, relate and have economic relationship integration with the West, with the East, with the Europe and all other uh, advanced economies. Forgetting that if they collaborate, if they cooperate, if they coordinate their affairs, their own continent is likely to, strong, to, 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 to be in a stronger position as against these individual uh, efforts that they are making. The second, uh, point, which is becoming moot actually, uh, the second challenge, which is becoming moot gradually, is political uh, uh, instability, as it were. Uh, maybe before now, uh, military rule is uh, uh, very uh, common and uh, attractive. That is giving way gradually. But even the, the, the civilian rule, I use that word advisedly, the civilian rule that we have as against democratic rule that we have today in most African countries is just a rule by a few individuals as against a rule of the common people. And to that extent, the man who is in charge is uh, like the French uh, emperor, Lazar Moahe, and the state. And where that happens, it means the man that is in charge of trade who is uh, named as minister or, or commissioner or whatever, is only there at the mercy and uh, at the uh, whims and caprices of the number one citizen. And to that extent, there is a lot of uh, limitation that such people actually suffer, which will dovetail into the kind of economic integration that we are looking for. To now compound the problem as this issue of insecurity. Now, at least in the, uh, uh, in the West African sub-region, as uh, put in place by banditry, uh, headsmen, uh, farmers clash, uh, Boko Haram insurgents, and all such uh, terrible, terrible, Insecure the economic, the, the challenge of economic disparity. The what we have is now with these uh, challenges that we have identified with uh, uh, the ECOWAS. The question is how do we channel or navigate the agreement that we presently put in place by the African countries in the name of AFCTA to 
now get what and where we want to, to where I want to be. One, there must be a deliberate policy on the part of the member states to actually integrate not the policy on paper, but practical and pragmatic steps must be taken for economic integration. Two, for me, it is also important that we create a level playing field for every African country, country who is a member of the agreement to actually integrate in such a way that Nigeria we see itself as equal to Ghana, to Kenya, to Liberia, to Morocco, to whatever, such that at the end of the day, we will not be scampering and be disintegrating instead of actually integrating economically. There is also the need to shed the ego gap that some of the states are presently putting on, such that at the end of the day, if this equal measure is uh, uh, put in place, we are likely to get to the El Dorado that we are seeking. For me, this is a work in progress. Uh, six, seven months is not enough to uh, determine the fate of an agreement of uh, an agreement of this import and purpose, but the road to it is to see ourselves as one common uh, people. Thank you so very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Prof. Thank you. Um, we still have um, about 10 to 15 minutes. So I'll just um, ask some of the questions that our um, audience have sent through in the chat. If you have any additional questions, please send them through. Um, so I'll start with a question for Dr. Mark, for Etienne Mark. Um, so Jean, um, Jean Bertrand is asking that one issue that has been around in some circles is the symbiotic relationship between OHADA and the AFCFTA. Um, and what are your thoughts on this? Etienne? Yes, thank you very much for, for this follow-up. Um, I, I do believe that um, uh, the OADA and the AFTA um, are in a symbiotic relationship. Why? Simply because they share the very uh, similar goal, which are development for Africa and Pan-Africanism. And we can therefore better understand why um, the permanent secretary of the OADA in 2019 called um, uh, for the African Union to integrate the OADA into the ongoing work related to AFC, FTA, and for the OADA to benefit from a commissioner position within it. Um, I don't believe that uh, he received a, a positive uh, reaction, but uh, still, um, I do believe that um, African institutions that uh, share a common goal should, should dialogue and, 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 and work together to, to, to accomplish their, their common goal. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Etienne. Um, and the next question is for um, Linda. So there is a comment on your presentation, Linda, and I'll add a question to that comment. Um, so the comment is looking at the status of the regional economic communities and the fact that they've um, been working towards free trade areas and common markets far longer than the CFTA has. And so the idea is for them to be building blocks um, towards the achievement of, um, of uh, a continental market. Um, so my question to you in relation to trade facilitation specifically, and I'm going to go back to something that um, Professor Gathi said earlier about the fact that trade facilitation um, provide, um, includes no assumption of capacity on the parts of member states, right? So it's probably one of the easiest areas. Well, he, he says it's a, these are deep integration agreements, right? Um, so what would be your response to um, a question about the capacity of member states 
to actually um, um, facilitate trade through the CFTA because capacity building is one of the big parts of the World Trade Organization TFA. So what would be your comments about um, the, the Continental Free Trade Agreement's contribution to that, especially looking at what has happened in um, the regional economic communities, East Africa um, in particular, the East African community? Well, uh, my response would be, indeed, we're going to face a challenge because you see, the African continental free trade is a free trade area. It's not a common market that compels everyone to follow single rules of procedures and all that. So I think the easiest way that I can think of is for regional economic communities to organize themselves well. I'll not use uh, East African community. Now look at SADAC, for instance. They have a common market protocol, but they have not implemented it. They are, the members have not signed it. So some of these regional economic communities had already began trade facilitation agreements and arrangements, but the implementation was the challenge. So if regional economic communities cannot implement their own protocols, how about individual countries implementing the after when they lack cap numerous capacities in, the, in their own? Let's just begin by our issue with infrastructure in the continent. Going, going, going back to my example, I want to import something from Nigeria. You know, we'll have the Shibata, the Ankara, my only option is to ship it via air, which is very expensive. Why? In Africa, we have the highest taxes when it comes to aviation industry, and it's impossible for me. The easiest route is by road, and the two regions, East and West Africa, is connected by through Central Africa. But right now, we have no access. We've, the continent is disintegrated. And right now, while we are trading, it's just within our borders within our regional economic communities, but even this is limited and often uh, disturbed by political uh, issues between countries. It's a challenge uh, for that we're going to face. And I guess the after secretariat would have to come up with measures of coming up with support to individual countries. The WTA, the WTO TFA has its um, TFA facility and it has its own methods of giving support to uh, African states and least developed countries. The Eastern African community has the Trademark Eastern Africa, then NGO, which is a, a funded organization that gives support to the region. So the success that we are seeing in the Eastern African community in trade facilitation, like the one-stop shops, you know, the single um, internet platform where there's information you can get, and, and all that, it's by external support. Indeed, the region would not have managed this amount of success on their own. And uh, for after, the African Union is at the center of creating this support to individual, individual states. After knows best the difference uh, we have in the continent in levels of development within even our regional economic communities. Now, if we bring everyone together into, into one big group, of course, there are countries that will be way advanced than others, and others would, be, would find it from difficult to impossible to implement thereafter because of those systemic challenges that they face and even colonial challenges that they face. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Sam, there's a question here from you, Dr. Sambo. Um, so um, Thomas asks um, about the structure of governance um, for the Continental Free Trade Agreement, um, saying that it's mostly the executive branch of the governments of member states. So you have heads of states and ministers who are involved in not just negotiating, but also in um, putting together the toolkit and delivering the toolkit. Um, and he says, why is this so? Is there any chance to include national parliaments, subnational units like counties, counties, federal units, business communities, civil society, and perhaps this would increase the legitimacy and the prospects of implementation for the, for the agreement? Well, thank you, uh, Prof, and uh, to you, thank to the colleague that uh, uh, raised the issue. Um, there is a lot of merit uh, and validity in the uh, question and in the assumption that uh, is being made uh, underlining the question. Uh, but I will maybe get one or two reservations or caveat uh, to this. Number one is that um, international organizations are member state driven. 
And um, since they are member state driven, they have to reflect the very um, implementation scheme that is followed in, in the countries, which is government led process. Um, so that's, what, that's why you, you have these in, uh, also in, a, in, a, in a FCFTA, like in WTO or World Bank or uh, other international organization. Number two, maybe, is that uh, even though I see some merit and validity in this, uh, is that um, this is a process. And um, once again, we, we, we have to make things in a way that really the ownership, the collective approach, the holistic approach will prevail at the end of the day. Uh, but we are in a phase of implementation whereby we only are bound to implement AFCFTA. We are bound to um, bound to, to implement what we have into the RECs. We are even bound to uh, implement what we have in the WTO and other international organizations. So this is a huge, this is a very massive bur burden, a very massive, a very heavy workload that need to be um, uh, channeled through first. And I guess, but in parallel, and maybe in terms of sequencing, uh, what uh, our colleague raised is, will be and is integral part, and um, they will finding uh, really ways in, in having those uh, being uh, factored in and really playing their part. Thank you very much, Dr. Samba. And the final question for Professor Igbewole. Um, so um, I'll give you the question from um, Craig Buyonge Mirito about the dispute settlement under the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. Um, you've spoken about the challenges of regional integration, particularly in West Africa. Now we know we have these different courts in the regional economic communities, the ECOWAS Court of Justice, the EAC Court, um, well, formerly the SADC Tribunal, the Commissar Court. So he's, um, this participant is asking, um, how would these link to the continental system um, for the free trade area? Um, is Professor Biwale in the room? Okay, I think we lost him. Um, so I think we have um, barely four minutes left. Um, I guess to speak to that, um, it, it would be very interesting to see how this would link up. The dispute settlement mechanism under the Continental Free Trade Agreement is very different from what you have in these different um, RECs. Um, and many of them have actually been more successful in handling human rights cases than in handling cases in trade and economic development. So it will be very interesting to see how um, a continental dispute settlement mechanism um, will facilitate trade in the region. And perhaps that will jumpstart the um, trade mechanisms um, in the judicial areas in the, in the RECs. Um, the judicial mechanisms for the RECs. Um, so I'm going to give each of the remaining panelists one minute to close up and um, give us your final words before we close. Um, I'll start with um, I'll start with Linda. Thank you very much, Edefe, and um, thank you very much to Afsil for organizing this uh, session and for speaking with my colleagues on this important topic. Um, what I would say is. I'll just uh, reference Dr. Professor Gadi, who spoke earlier today, and he was saying that Africa needs to trade more with itself than the outside world, which is the point of the after. But if you look at the current trends, it seems that the outside world is buying the after more than we in the continent. For instance, right now, the conversation about the after is centered among lawyers, some professors, you know, and some business people. And even in these circles, you find that many people are not understanding what they're after is and the goal it serves to, to achieve. Everyone is excited about it, but we are losing track of the challenges that we have that are structural and also because of our own political issues and the attitude of our continent towards implementing international agreements. So we are high on the expectation and not really focusing on how are we going to implement this uh, agreement and how are you going to make trading in Africa possible? I believe the AFTA will work. I believe that it's the key to lifting millions of our people out of poverty. However, we need to have serious commitment into making it practical and implement it to make uh, free trade in the continent a reality. 
Thank you very much. Um, very quickly, Etienne, I think we're going to get kicked out in a few seconds. Okay, so if I have just uh, enough time to thank again um, the organization and for those insightful uh, comments and uh, observation. And also I do believe that every race of the continent have its own roles and have to work in intelligence with each other for making AFC, FTA um, a, a reality and make everything work all together. Thank you again. Thank you very much.